I think we can get started. Um, hello, everyone. I am Emily Silva, a PhD student in um, population health sciences with a focus on environmental epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. And I'm working under my advisor, Dr. Shruti Mahalingaya, who um, unfortunately can't make it today. Um, and we are studying how various environmental exposures affect reproductive health outcomes. Um, welcome to the environmental and reproductive health lecture series. This is a series of lectures focused on expanding our inclusion of women's health outcomes into environmental and public health research. Please stay tuned for invitations to future lectures. I want to quickly go over the ground rules for today's lecture. Um, this lecture is being recorded. You may put your video on or you can leave it off. Um, and to ask questions during the presentation, please enter into the chat or you're welcome to unmute and interrupt. Um, and then we will also have a moderated Q&A at the end of the lecture and we'll keep a list of all of the questions that are asked. Um, so I'm very excited today to introduce our presenter. Uh, Dr. Alan J. Wilcox is an emeritus scientist in the epidemiology branch of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, NIEHS, in Durham, North Carolina. His research interests are in reproductive and perinatal epidemiology. He has carried out studies on infertility, pregnancy loss, complications of pregnancy, fetal growth and preterm delivery, birth defects, and cerebral palsy. He is author of a textbook, Fertility and Pregnancy in Epidemiologic Perspective, published by Oxford University Press. He is past president of the American Epidemiological Society, the Society for Epidemiologic Research, SER, and the Society for Perinatal and Pediatric Epidemiologic Research. He served for 14 years as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Epidemiology, SER awarded him the Rotham Career Achievement Award in 2018 and the Distinguished Service Award in 2020. He has an MD from the U University of Michigan, a PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina, and an honorary doctoral degree from the University of Bergen, Norway. Um, so Dr. Wilcox, welcome and feel free to get started. Thank you, Emily. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you. I wish I could actually be with you, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, and thank you, Ariel, for organizing this. Uh, let me share my screen. Is that working? Yes. Okay. So, um, let me give you a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to do a very short summary of menses, uh, things you probably already are well aware of. Uh, I'm going to talk about a study called the Tremor study, which is uh, documents menstrual variability. And I'm going to tell a personal story related to that. And then I'm going to talk some about menstrual variability and its relationship to women's health and what the future of studying menstrual variability might be. So uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not an endocrinologist. I'm not even an epidemiologist who studies menstrual cycles, as you may have noticed from my introduction. Uh, I'm somebody who came to study menses just because it was necessary as a part of my interest in fertility and pregnancy. So um, I don't come here to talk about my own scientific contributions as much as I do to talk about the history of this area and where it's leading us. So the menstrual cycle, what we knew before amazingly recently, was only this, that women bled about every 28 days. And what that hides is an amazing uh, cycle of events uh, related to hormones. Um, let's see if I can get this out of my way. Um, there is ovulation somewhere in the middle between these two bleeding events. And the ovulation defines the follicular phase and the luteal phase, the follicular phase from the first day of menses up to the day of ovulation. 
and the follicular phase from the, I'm sorry, the luteal phase from ovulation to the last day before the onset of the next period. But the really important thing, and this is the, uh, the fertile days, which are related to ovulation, the five days before and the day of ovulation. But the important thing is this pattern here of estrogen that goes from very low to quite high, and then at a more middling area, and then down again before the next bleed, and progesterone, which rises during the luteal phase. And these, you know, they have direct effects on the woman's reproductive system, but there are lots of organs in the body that have receptors for estrogen and progesterone. And so these cyclic hormones of the menstrual cycle are doing more than affecting the uterus and the ovaries. They are uh, having effects on a lot of uh, tissues that are relevant to health. And variability in these hormones, variability in the cycle and variability in these hormones uh, are, are very likely to have influence on a woman's health outcomes. So I speak as somebody who, unlike my most of my audience, um, has never had a menstrual cycle, but this is clearly an integral part of a woman's life. It's a source of morbidity, excessive bleeding, dysmenorrhea. It is a framework for fertility. Fertility happens at some very specific time in between the bleeding. Changes in bleeding can signal underlying pathology. And the fluctuations of hormones can affect, affect the risk of chronic diseases. So how much research has been done on menstrual cycles? One way to tackle that is to go to PubMed. And I found that there were 44,000 scientific papers that were cited as dealing with menstrual cycles. So that seems like a lot. You'll be pleased to know that's more than the number of papers on getting a nose job, but not quite as many papers as there are on getting a cavity and way less than there are on the prostate. So as I said at the onset, I am not coming to you as an expert on menses. And I probably wouldn't be even speaking to you about this today if it weren't for an accident of my personal history. And I'll come back to that. But first, let me tell you a story about a study that began 90 years ago in the Student Health Service at the University of Minnesota. So 90 years ago, this project was started at the University of Michigan Health Service. And the story behind this, this of course is not a picture of the health service at that time. The current health service is called Boynton Health. You, I want you to remember that name. But the story behind this study was that there was a young biostatistician on the faculty at Minnesota who was a newlywed and his wife had terrible dysmenorrhea. And when she went to see physicians about this, they told her, well, her problem was that her periods were not 28 days in regular. And this biostatistician was uh, dismayed by that diagnosis because he felt that there wasn't any biological process that didn't have variability. But when he looked in the scientific literature, there was very little evidence of that variability because the kind of data they collected were very self-confirming. Uh, um, um, they were you know, asking women if their cycles were regular in every 20 days and 28 days, women would say, well, yes. So uh, this young fellow decided to collect data and he cooperated with the uh, woman who is the director of the health service to um, invite freshman women at the university to keep a menstrual diary. And the genius of this study was in this data collection card. This fellow, Alan Trelore, designed a card that would include a whole year's worth of menses on one card that would fit in a woman's purse. And furthermore, he had the very 
clever idea of making the rows in 28 days so that 28 day cycles would line up in a column. So women circled the day of their onset of menses and circled every day afterwards. So you could look at the first day of bleeding uh, going down the column if they were at 28 days. So the, the, the thing I admire about this card is how simple it was, women could carry it in their purse. On the back of the card was open-ended where women could record anything that might have disturbed their cycles, serious illness or pregnancy. So starting in 1934, freshman women were invited to join and about half agreed. So over that period of time, nearly 2000 women were enrolled. More than half of them continued after they graduated from college. And nearly 40% continued until menopause. A real testimony to the strength of a simple data collection instrument. Some women enrolled their daughters as they reached menarche. A second cohort was enrolled a generation later. And by 1967, 2,700 women had contributed nearly a half a million, million menstrual cycles. The primary data collection continued for more than 70 years, counting that second cohort and their daughters. A phenomenal prospective study. And some women provided complete lifetime menstrual histories. So, so far as I know, this is the only published record of menstrual cycles for one woman's lifetime. So it starts when she had her menarche, very irregular cycles at first, and then fairly irregular for a number of years, settling out in her middle adulthood with occasional unexpected spikes, and then a pregnancy rather late in, in her life, in her reproductive life, another pregnancy, a third. Uh, after each pregnancy, a lot more variability, and then after her third pregnancy, uh, spiky variability ending in her menopause. So Trelore collected a vast amount of data before there was computerization and before he even had money to support the study. It was maintained on a shoe, shoestring and kept in shoeboxes. It was 25 years before he got any substantial financial support. And it was because in 1960, a drug company that made birth control pills was interested in women's patterns of women's cycles. So they paid for enrollment of that second cohort and they paid for rather primitive, but still computerization of the data. And so 32 years, after he started the study, how's that for delayed gratification? Trelore and his college published their first and main descriptive paper, 50 pages long, 24 figures. Alan expected this to change the world of menstrual studies. This is the title page in a journal you've never heard of because it folded maybe because it published papers that were 50 pages long. Uh, you see the second author here is Ruth Boynton, the partner in the study who at that time was the head of the Women's Health Service. And I like this study from the paper. I might mention that this paper is hard to get, but I got NIH to make me an electronic copy and I would be glad to share it with anybody who's interested. So this is the kind of uh, graphs that Alan was able to put into this paper. And these are percentiles of the length of menstrual cycles across age. So this is an accumulation of cross-sectional uh, data uh, with some women con 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 contributing a fair amount of data. And you can see this 50 percentile line is here. And at 50th percentile, the median, the uh, median cycle length declines over woman's re reproductive age about three days on average. 
and then increase a little bit at the end. But the other striking pattern is this variability at the beginning, at the end. Uh, and when we look at the 99th percentile compared to the first percentile, there's really a wide range of uh, menstrual cycle links in these women, a range that starts very wide, decreases with age, and then springs up again. So Alan was interested in menstrual cycle variability, and indeed he showed it. So this is, this is the data for women at age 30. The range of cycle links from the first percentile to the 99th percentile is 20 to 50 days, a 30-day range, clearly establishing that 28 days is not the one and only normal uh, cycle length. So we know that there's two parts to the menstrual cycle. Where is the most variation? Is it in the first half or the second half? And you probably know this, but it's an important thing to keep in mind. The follicular phase, and these are data from a study we did, small study on 200 women, uh, where we collected daily urine so we could get a pretty good fix on the ovulation day. The follicular phase ranged over 45 days. So this is the time from LMP to ovulation. And if you think about the fact that the fertile days are tied to ovulation, this is why predicting a woman's fertile days is so difficult uh, based just on a calendar, because it can be all over the place from very early to very late. The luteal phase, a 13 day range. And this is important too, because very often you will read papers that say, well, uh, the expected menses is 14 days after ovulation, as if that is, as if the average is, uh, is covers everybody. And obviously it does not. A lot of variability there. So now here's my story. When I was a brand new epidemiologist, 1980, I was interested in miscarriage, epidemiology of miscarriage at a time when not very much had been done and not very much data were available. So one of my colleagues mentioned to me a data set that might be promising as a source of, mens, mens, of, uh, uh, of spontaneous abortion data. And it was Trelore's study. Uh, a, a, a few papers had been printed after the uh, 67 that uh, acknowledged the presence of pregnancies in his data. So I tracked him down to see if he might be interested in, in an analysis of miscarriages in his data. And by amazing luck, it turns out he had retired to Chapel Hill which was a 20 minute drive from our institute. So when I contact, contacted him in 1980, he was probably around the age I am now. He was eager to talk about his project. He was a kind man, if a little prickly about what he perceived as a lack of appreciation for his life's work and with some justification. I'm really sad that I don't have a picture of him. Um, it says something about his unconventional career that uh, there is no uh, online uh, record of him personally. He was a stocky guy, uh, shock of gray hair, Australian. And I spent many afternoons at his house in Chapel Hill talking about his study trying to understand uh, the data that we were gonna analyze. And we collaborated on a couple of papers. Uh, one was looking at the risk of miscarriage over time using his two courts of, cohorts of women. So for a while we supported that study. We paid for the annual collection of data and we got a copy of his data that we uh, stored away. But my research interests moved on, and so did he. He left Chapel Hill. This was the early 1980s. 
So I didn't think much about this again until I was contacted by a graduate student at Hopkins named Siobhan Harlow. And she came to NIHS to analyze the Tror data. Siobhan, if I think she was invited actually to speak to you all and her, uh, one of her fellows came. Uh, Siobhan energized, in my opinion, energized the field of menstrual cycle studies by uh, bringing a fresh, a fresh and very engaged intellect to, uh, to look at uh, how we might analyze patterns and, and how it might be related to health. And this paper that she published in 1995, even today, as I go back and read it, is an excellent review. If you have any interest in sort of uh, a, a, a great overview of the relation of menses to women's health, this is a, a great place to start. So under stimulus from Siobhan, other people in my group went back to the Trelor women and interviewed them uh, in their um, late adulthood. Uh, the women who had originally enrolled in the uh, 1930s cohort and asked about their illness and wrote a series of papers about menstrual cycles and those women. So one was a study, a paper on the medical conditions that affected the menstrual cycle. And they found, for example, that long cycles were more common with later menarche, women who were depressed and women who were obese. And these studies that I'm gonna show you are, are, I don't wanna present these as the only studies that have been done on uh, men, uh, menarche and women's health. Uh, there, are, there is a literature here, but they're all difficult because either you rely on a woman's recall of her menstrual patterns or on prospective data, which are scarce. And of course, uh, limited in their sample size, even with such large cohorts. So this is a paper looking at menstrual cycle patterns in breast cancer. Uh, Siobhan was an impetus to this, if not an author. And women with very long cycles at, in their youth had nearly a twofold increased risk of breast cancer. This is not consistent with other studies, but you know, as, as I say, other studies also have their limitations. So I think there's some, a lot of unsolved questions here. This is menstrual patterns and ischemic heart disease. No, asso no associations with various characteristics of menses, although women with later menarche had lower risk of heart disease. Diabetes. No association once again with menstrual cycle patterns, although these were described in very crude ways. Uh, but there was a possible association between long bleeding and later diabetes risk. So what has been done to characterize menstrual cycle irregularity? In one of my last meetings with Alan, he described a question that he would have loved to ask. And it was very difficult in the data that he had, partly because of the cumbersome way the data were computerized. He was interested in how women's patterns might change over time. Um, we knew something about all these cross-sectional data that he had, but what happens with an individual woman? Might some women be very regular for a while and then become irregular? Uh, he, the, uh, at the time, I didn't fully realize the implications of what he was talking about. But I do remember that he, he compared it to a long rope and the individual woman's um, histories being entwined in this rope. And all we've looked at so far is the overall rope and not the pattern within each strand. So about a, uh, you know, quite a few years after Alan died, other people looking at his data with uh, improved methods tried to 
characterize the types of variation by inspection. And so these solid bands are uh, interquartile ranges. So they came up with five types of cycles. One they called very stable with relatively small interquartile range over time, 12%. Another stable with more variation, okay, equal numbers. Erratic with a downward slope, 30%. Erratic with an upward slope, 35%. And then highly erratic. Well, this is all by inspection. Um, and at least a first stab at the problem. And you'll notice that only 27% of these of women fell into the stable pattern and 73 were in erratic. So variation is, is itself variable and maybe informative if we knew how to crack the code. And then came something that nobody predicted or even imagined. It's recharging the world of menstrual cycle research. It's phone apps. In 2019, uh, the people who work on natural cycles published a paper in which they summarized 600,000 menstrual cycles collected from 125,000 women a median of 11 cycles per women. And they provided this graph, 95% uh, confidence intervals here around the mean cycle length at these various ages. And you can see um, wide variability among the younger women, less among women in their middle eight, middle reproductive years, and then more at the end, and this linear decline. And if I manipulate that graph to put it next to Trelor's, it's very similar. Both of them show a decline of three days, median decline of three days from ages 20 to 40. So another app, Clue, published a paper the next year with 380,000 women. And they did a very interesting thing. They characterized women by whether their median cycle length was less than nine days or nine days or greater. So they have a median number of 11 cycles per women. They look at the cycle difference, cycle length difference in each woman. woman and then they say, then they classify those women by having a median difference of less than nine days or nine or more days. And they show a very interesting thing, which is the women who have the less variable cycles have also a lower mean, whereas the women with more variable cycles have longer cycles. And so this is a, a cardinal observation of menstrual cycles, that irregular cycles are also long cycles. And so when we look at those papers, those old papers that were looking at the effects of long cycles on health outcomes, they're, it's, they're also looking at irregular cycles. It's diff difficult to un unentangle those two things. So this brings us to the paper that, uh, I sent to you all as, uh, something that I would be talking about. This is a um, paper on menstrual, menstrual irregularity in relation to pregnancy awareness. So the earliest sign that a woman has that she might be pregnant is missing her period. If she thinks she might be pregnant and does testing, before she misses her period, it's possible to de detect a pregnancy. But in terms of symptoms, the missed period is the earliest uh, sign. So what we found in this paper, th and this paper was initiated by a, a, a uh, demographer, Jenna Nobles at University of Wisconsin. What we found was uh, defining cycle irregularity 
as two successive cycles differing by seven or more days, that irregularity was lowest in the younger women. I'm sorry, highest in the younger women, obviously. Uh, Twofold risk of irregularity among the youngest women and getting less and less among the, the uh, reference group, which was uh, late 30s. So not surprising, totally consistent with other studies. And then we looked at its association with uh, underlying illness, uh, polycystic ovary disease, obviously not surprisingly, high risk of irregularity, diabetes, obesity, hormone irregularity, sure, thyroid dysfunction, recent delivery, all of this consistent with what we know. And then we looked at ethnic differences, and this was surprising. Uh, The group with the lowest irregularity were non-Hispanic Black, and the group with the highest was Hispanic. And I was actually quite mystified by this, but it does appear that, and we are not controlling for anything here. This is just uh, the observed irregularity among these groups. And there is a fair amount of data showing that Hispanic women, uh, when they have polycystic ovary disease or obesity, that they're much more likely to have uh, severe disruption of of their hormones. So there may be uh, aspects of, of being Hispanic having to do with diet or some aspect of culture that contributes to this irregularity. But, you know, the question is, why would why did we do this? And our impetus for this simple paper that actually showed a lot of what we knew already was the abortion law that went into effect in Texas just a few months earlier. So the Texas abortion law is widely discussed as a six week abortion law. In fact, that's how the governor talked about it. The governor of Texas said, The new law should not present a problem for women because the law provides at least six weeks for a person to be able to get an abortion. One of my colleagues said this is a great reason why there should be sex education in the schools. So what's wrong with that statement? First of all, it's not a six week law, It's it's a law saying that abortion cannot be done if the physician detects a fetal heartbeat. It's a fetal heartbeat law. So the question is, when is the fetal heartbeat detectable? There aren't a lot of data on this. The the best data that we could find was from 18 years ago, done on ART pregnancies, where they had an exact date of conception, and they followed them daily for evidence of electronic uh, activity of the tissue that would develop into a heart. And the earliest day in which the uh, electrical activity could be detected was 23 days after fertilization. So when is that? The expected onset of menses is often talked about as 14 days after ovulation. But we know there's a lot of variation in luteal phase. So that variation in luteal phase is especially difficult if a woman knows that she has irregular cycles. If her cycles are irregular, she may not know that she's missed a cycle at day 23, because that's still a possible day for her to experience menses. And so women may not recognize that they are pregnant until after the electrical impulse is detectable, especially if they weren't planning to get pregnant. There are contraceptive failures. There are all kinds of reasons why women may not realize that they could be pregnant. So then there are whole classes of women who are at particular risk for not recognizing that they're pregnant until too late for abortion under the Texas law. Young women who have more variability, 
women who are obese or have polycystic ovary disease, women who are Hispanic. So we were very interested in getting this observation into print as possible uh, information for those who are making legal challenges to the law. So we know that not all cycles are regular in 28 days. Torres data showed us that very well. But what are the patterns of menstruation? That is much less clear. We know very little about how cycles might vary within women and what can cause a woman's pattern to change. How might changes be related to existing disease and future disease risk? Alan Trelor's metaphor of a rope with many fibers is still an interesting question 40 years later. And this is why I think the flood of data from menstrual cycle apps are so important because of the opportunity it gives us, you, to understand better how menstrual cycle variability is related to important health outcomes for the women. There was even a paper I just saw in uh, pediatric, pediatric and perinatal epidemiology just uh, uh, a few days ago that talked about menstrual cycle patterns as a predictor of pregnancy outcomes, as a predictor of preterm delivery. So there's a lot of really great stuff to do. And I hope some of the people who are listening here are gonna be able to contribute to that. So I'm glad to um, take questions and discuss this area. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilcox. Thank you, that was a wonderful presentation. and a great um, thorough history of studies on menstrual cycles. Um, and I also really appreciated you sharing your own personal stories of um, work with all of these people. Um, everyone should feel free to um, put questions in the chat or if you would like to unmute and ask um, Dr. Wilcox directly, that's also welcome. Um, I'll give a minute for Anyone to get started? I can start by asking, oh, sorry, Huichi, were you gonna jump in? Um, thank you, Emily, and thank you, um, Dr. Wilcox, for this very nice talk. And um, I really appreciate the very comprehensive overview on menstrual cycles and how um, those information can have implications for women's health and for future um, research. So, um, as you may know, I was working. Um, I was current. I am currently working on um, also like using mobile phone um, app uh, of menstrual tracking um, to understand how menstrual cycle can vary um, within and between women. So my question is like, you know, I have been reading through lots of like some of the. Um, associations from you know OBGYN, um, they're releasing guidelines for how to identify a long and short cycle or how to um, define a irregular menstrual cycle based on very limited empirical data um, from the population. But on the other hand, um, some of our research have to use those definitions to kind of like distinguish between, for example, like regularity versus irregularity or long or short cycle. So kind of feel like this is kind of like a loop, right? Like, for example, we have very limited information on what has been known, but we have to use what has been summarized from the limited information to guide our study to gain more understanding on this, um, on this in this area. So I just wonder, like, do you have any comments or or suggestions how we can break this like a loop or like what um, future efforts are needed for us to better I uh, understand um, menstrual cycle and um, cycle characteristics um, given the current situation on limited knowledge or empirical data. You know, the reason Alan Trelor did his study is because he really hated the clinical dogma 
And so I think it's the job of epidemiologists to look at all this with fresh eyes. Obviously, we can't ignore um, the, how the clinicians define these things. And, and we need especially to pay attention if we're to uh, compare our results to the existing literature that has used certain definitions. But I think we also have to be imaginative and creative in uh, keeping our minds open about what is important and what isn't. And that, that requires data. You know, we, we can't answer it by our impressions or by history or by the literature. And, and that's the great thing about what's in our, in, in, the, in our grasp today, that these apps provide so much data that we can do something that's never been possible before. So I, I think we have to do both things. We have to keep in mind how clinicians have been looking at this, but also look at it with fresh eyes so we can, we can uh, maybe influence what the clinicians are doing and also relate our work to what's been done before. Yeah, that is very helpful. And um, yeah, I agree because sometimes I just have the same question, right? Like how can you guys determine, you know, how many days above like some certain threshold, there would be a wrong cycle. But um, yeah, and I also um, agree that, um, you know, with the, so much data can be collected from, um, you know, the uh, mobile phone app and we can do something groundbreaking and also um, very important to help us better understanding women's health. But thank you very much for um, this great talk and also um, for sharing your thoughts and comments on this. Thank you. I can ask a short question. A very good talk, Alan, and um, really enjoyed the the history you presented uh, as well. Um, it, what would be your thought on kind of length versus variability within a woman as being more predictive or ultimately um, useful in epidemiologic studies? And I think probably has a different um, sense clinically, right? I mean, I would think it's, it's harder to gather data on variability because you need good retrospective or prospective data versus a cross-sectional assessment of length of cycle. Um, so just kind of your thoughts on length versus variability, uh, which you talked about both of them. Yeah, I mean, it's in a way, it's an empirical question. Uh, And bringing in the clinical uh, perspective, Russ, um, how well do women report their cycle length and their cycle variability? I think that would, we, we don't really know. And so, you know, one part of that question in my mind is uh, when we have the data, does length, with regular cycles have a different implication than links with irregular cycles. And then the other part of the question is, how well can women tell us if we ask? Um, and I, I frankly don't know the answer to that. When we uh, did our early pregnancy study, we asked women coming into the study if they could if, there's, if they could predict when their next menses was gonna arrive, was uh, whether cycles generally predictable or not predictable. And that was, that question itself was highly predictive of their regularity during the study. But, um, you know, that's kind of a crude measure. So, um, yeah, I, I think we, we still have to untangle that. We have about 10 minutes left, so probably time for two more questions. 
I actually um, had a question, Dr. Wilcox, about, um, I thought it was really interesting when you showed um, the work that's been done to separate um, kind of into different types, um, group women by variabilities across how, how their cycle looks across their lifespan. I was wondering if any work has been done to um, link those types to clinical factors or physiologic differences, or if it's really just data driven at this point. Yeah, I don't know of any work to do that. And, uh, you know, that's obviously a ripe area for investigation. Shruti also had a question about that I think she did send you ahead of time about whether you think menstrual cycle irregularity alone is enough of an indicator of PCOS or um, how you think adding in markers of androgen excess um, changes these estimates. Yeah, once again, I mean, I'm not an endocrinologist, so I, I can only fall back on, uh, on what the empirical data might say. And if we had enough data of, irregular, of a population of women, and we could look at uh, the predictive power of any particular pattern, you know, false positives and false negatives, uh, then we could start trying to answer that question. But, you know, it's been, I think to, to date, it's been very hard to answer that question because we're relying on women's recall and that is, uh, it's very, it's one thing to report how much you weigh. It's another thing to report how much you've weighed over your lifetime uh, and your ups and downs. And so I think uh, recalling menstrual cycle patterns is a really difficult, I would, I would guess it's a really difficult thing. Related to some of the questions about, um self-reported irregularity versus the more, you know, finely data-driven um, ability we now have to measure prospectively cycles using app data. Um, do you think that, do you, are you aware of um, any questions being asked on the apps about kind of like how a woman would self-report her regularity, whether she would um, be able to say my cycle um, is predictable within seven days or not? And then and you know, use that to look at how measurement error in some of our previous studies might have. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I don't know, I mean, the data may exist. I certainly haven't seen them published. And um, I wonder if these apps ask women that at the outset, what their usual cycle length is or what their, how regular their cycles are. I mean, it would be great if they did. I, I don't know that they do. Maybe somebody else does. I'm not aware, but I think that that would be really interesting. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Study. Great. Um, any final questions today? I'm just going to jump in really quick uh, to ask everyone to please First, thank you for coming, but also uh, please make sure you take the feedback survey. I sent it in the chat and also sent you an email if you registered with the link. Um, thank you. Okay. We can sign off. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful <laughs> Thank day. You, everyone. Thank you.